Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, number 22, for mid-July 2023. Shop until thou droppest. Strawbridge and Clothier at the beginning. Welcome to the 22nd episode of Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, an historic and active cemetery in Bala Kinwood, Pennsylvania. I am Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine from Temple University, volunteer tour guide and volunteer podcaster. Laurel Hill West opened in 1869 across the river from its sister cemetery, Laurel Hill East in Philadelphia. It is more than twice as big as Laurel Hill East. It has a totally different feel and a strikingly different population. Like Laurel Hill East, it is open 365 days a year, now from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. There is plenty of parking at the business office just off Belmont Avenue or at the conservatory and the bell tower. If you enter from Belmont, follow the road past the second gate with the white line in the middle. Another possibility, just duck in while you're walking the Kinwood Trail. Your best bet for public transportation is to take the R6 to Maniunk or a bus to the Wissahickon Transportation Center on Ridge Avenue, then cross the Pencoid Pedestrian Bridge, walk up Writers Ferry Road to the entrance across from the Pet Cemetery. This 22nd episode of Biographical Bites from Bala is from mid-July 2023. As transportation in and around Philadelphia improved in the mid-19th century and the population exploded, merchants found more people clamoring for their wares. Two Quakers, Justice Clayton Strawbridge and Isaac Hallowell Clothier, joined forces and opened a small fabric store on the corner of 8th and Market. By the end of the century, they had thousands of employees and had expanded several fold and became what they claimed was the biggest dry goods store in the country. Hear this fascinating story of the beginnings of Strawbridge and Clothier on today's podcast. I only heard about Marchetti's Constant in the last few years. It's one of those principles that makes perfect sense once you hear it, you know, kind of like the Dunning-Kruger effect. In 1994, Italian physicist Cesar Marchetti declared people have always been willing to commute for about a half hour one way from their homes each day. Now, think about Philadelphia before the 1854 consolidation. The city was roughly rectangular. It ran from the Delaware on the east to the Schuylkill on the west, that's about two miles, and from Mulberry Street, which is now Arch Street on the north, to Cedar Street, which is now South Street on the south. That's just a little more than a mile. So that gives us about two square miles. This is a three-mile-per-hour world where your feet or your horse would carry you where you liked. High Street was the shopping district. We know it today as Market Street. There were also shops on 2nd Street. But from the city's periphery to its center was less than a half hour walk or ride. 
When steam trains started running in Philadelphia in the 1830s and 1840s, some of them ran up to 20 miles per hour. That meant, theoretically, that people would be comfortable if they lived up to 10 miles away from their workplace. Remember the formula for the area of a circle. Area equals pi r squared. So the new 10-mile radius meant that by Marchetti's constant, there was now an accessible area of more than 300 square miles within 30 minutes of the city center. And with the consolidation of 1854, Philadelphia was suddenly a major metropolis of 135 square miles. Until 1861, Philadelphia enjoyed a huge commercial business with the American South. As I talked about in an earlier podcast, All Bones Considered Number 21, Me and My Machine, the textile barons, manufacturers lost their primary resource for cotton, as well as their primary market for cheap cotton goods, and they could not collect on goods already sent south before the Civil War started. It was also in 1861 that a 23-year-old Quaker named Justice Strawbridge, that's J-U-S-T-U-S, rented a three-story red brick building on the northwest corner of 8th and Market Street to start a dry goods business. Eighty years earlier, this building had served as the office of the Department of State. It's where Thomas Jefferson performed his duties as Secretary of State. High Street between 8th and 9th, had been the home of elegant federal period brick homes, most of which now served as stores or hotels. This property had belonged to a well-to-do grazier. Grazier is someone who fattens cattle and sheep for the market. His name was David Seckel. Mr. Seckel had some pear trees on the property, which produced a small, sweet, crisp fruit It became very popular and eventually took on his name, the Seckle Pear. I'll talk about that another podcast, but David Seckle is interred at Laurel Hill East in Section O. Justice Strawbridge's grandfather, also named Justice, had moved to East Central Pennsylvania from New England. His son, George Frederick Heap Strawbridge, 1804 to 1841, earned a medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania, which was then on 9th Street, near Market. He married a Quaker girl from Mount Holly named Anne Zelly. But when George died suddenly at age 36, Anne took their three sons, age 5, 3, and 1, back to Mount Holly to live with her people. It was the middle son, born in 1838, who was Justice Clayton Strawbridge. Justice was only 15 years old when he moved to Philadelphia, and he took a job with a dry goods importer and jobber named Joshua L. Bailey, who had recently gone into business on Market Street between 2nd and 3rd. Justice started as a clerk at the going rate of $50 per year, and he worked off and on with Bailey for several years, learning the business until he felt that he could strike out on his own. Now, the building at 8th and Market had long been familiar to women shoppers as the location of J. Ross Hoops's cheap store, and it served as a primary source for the various cloth materials, casimir, satinettes, and vestings, shawls, merinos, bombazines, alpacas, and flannels, damask tablecloths and napkins, bedspreads, tickings, and other household goods. Hoops died in 1859 at age 37. He's interred in Laurel Hill East, Section 2. Most women did not buy ready-made apparel. They made clothing for themselves and their families at home. Some were using recently invented sewing machines with various improvements by Americans Elias Howe and Isaac Singer. Justice signed a partnership agreement with his former fellow salesman Joseph Cowperthwaite, Jr. in 1861, and he contributed the entire capital of $2,500. Cowperthwaite is interred at Laurel Hill East in Section E. That's the very same teardrop-shaped area that holds the remains of Laurel Hill's first permanent resident, Mercy Carlisle. Justice's new store 
became all-consuming. He recalled years later, My business career started on this corner. I was porter, clerk, window washer, and decorator, and often swept the pavement before breakfast. Business thrived as local manufactories started producing ready-to-wear for the Philadelphia housewife rather than the southern market. The location at 8th and Market was centrally located. In the same block, you could buy furniture, groceries, china, glassware, and hardware. On the other side of Market were several men's clothing and furnishing stores, hotels, and a dry goods competitor named Cooper and Cunard, who also carried a sideline of cloaks and mantillas. Farmers and butchers sold their wares from sheds that stood in the middle of Market, just east of 8th Street. The store was tiny. It was 24 feet wide on Market and just a little longer on 8th. That's less than 700 square feet. And since customers did not like climbing stairs, all merchandise was on the ground floor. Bolts of calico, muslin, floor linen, and other stuffs were stocked in the basement. The store motto was small profits, one price, for cash only. This was refreshing in a time when the general philosophy of the industry was let the buyer beware, and haggling over a price was the accepted way of doing business. This simple motto gave Strawbridge respectability which had not yet been earned by other stores. When Justice felt his future was secure enough to marry, he fancied a young woman named Mary Lukens from West Grove in Chester County who had come to Philadelphia to teach. They married in meeting and settled at 428 North Franklin Street, which was an easy walk to the store. Justice and Mary had five children together. Strawbridge's business was based on public trust, so he needed a steady, reliable supply of materials to sell. Isaac Hallowell Clothier became one of his most dependable suppliers. The Clothiers were at one time another Mount Holly family, also members of the Society of Friends, as were about half the townspeople at that time. There was a story about an occurrence during the Revolutionary War when Hessians broke into the Clothier home. Patriarch James Clothier was away at the time, but his wife, whose name I cannot find, mollified the Redcoats by baking them an oven full of bread and serving them whiskey. Isaac Hallowell Clothier was born in Philadelphia in 1837. He attended Friends Central School, and at age 17, learned the dry goods business from local merchant George Dillwyn Parrish, who's interred at Laurel Hill East Section U. Isaac's father, Caleb, had been involved deeply in the anti-slavery movement, and Isaac grew up attending passionate lectures by Dr. Henry Ward Beecher, Philadelphia's William Henry Furness, also buried at Laurel Hill East, and many others. And when his idol, Abraham Lincoln, came through Philadelphia on his way to his inauguration, the 24-year-old Isaac kept pace with the open carriage down Chestnut Street to Independence Hall so he could hear his hero's voice. Isaac found as his life partner another Mary, a daughter of merchant William Jackson, who lived in Derby. Together they had eight children, including peace activist and suffragette Hannah Clothier Hull, and Hall of Fame tennis player William Clothier. I've already done podcasts on both of them. After a few years of developing a close friendship and even vacationing together, Strawbridge invited Clothier into a partnership. The new firm would become official on 1 July 1868. Both men were 30 years old. Isaac described the business plan. The idea of success as a merchant is to render the best of service to the community, to elevate the condition of employees, and while doing this, to acquire wealth as a natural consequence of a wise, energetic, and prudent management of affairs. But the man who has acquired wealth and has not acquired the respect of his fellow men, and especially of his own people, 
those who have aided in building his fortune, is not a successful man. Isaac's father-in-law, William Jackson, had purchased other property at 8th and Market in 1864 from the estate of Mary Seckle Pepper, daughter of pearman David Seckle. Mary had married George Pepper, one of the richest men in the city, an owner of Ferry Hill, a summer property about four miles out of town up Ridge Pike, which had once belonged to pioneering surgeon and soda pop inventor Philip Singh Physic. Eventually, it became the central section of Laurel Hill East Cemetery. Jackson was willing to demolish his old building and erect a modern five-story structure, which he then leased to his son-in-law, Isaac, and Isaac's new partner, Justice. Isaac was in charge of merchandise. Justice was in charge of the plant and operations. Their nearest competition physically was another dry goods store at 6th and Market, under the partnership of two guys named Brown and Wanamaker. Compared to the old building, the new one was large, a frontage of 42 feet on Market Street and slightly more than 67 feet on 8th Street. 2,800 square feet, that's more than four times what they had before. They kept the stock in the basement and they hauled it up by a rope elevator. In the corner of the basement, there was a desk which was shared by the two owners, but it was rarely occupied. Accessibility to the store could not have been better. The 8th Street trolleys brought customers directly from Germantown and Chestnut Hill, while Market Street trolleys operated from the Dock Street across Delaware River from Camden all the way to the Schuylkill. Some customers drove up to the store in their carriages. Those who walked on the sidewalk had the protection of a series of large awnings. And now the store had about 30 employees. In these days before cash registers, 14-year-old boys were hired as cash boys, whose job was to take the purchases from the counters to the cashiers and the wrapping desks. They received $2 per week, but also had to attend to gas lights in those pre-electric light days and the awnings and sometimes would even deliver a package on their way home. The store did have one delivery wagon, but it only made two trips a day, and then it didn't go very far. A 13-year-old boy from Darby named Claude Dukenfeld took a job as a cash boy, but a regular job was not to his taste. He lasted less than three months. Instead of waiting to be promoted to stock boy, Claude took a job at a pool parlor racking balls. He eventually became an actor with his new name, W.C. Fields. Much to their quiet satisfaction, the first year's operations brought Justice and Isaac a net gain of $15,000. They each took enough money to live on, and they plowed the rest back into the business. The next year, their net profit went up to $41,000. Isaac bought a farm at Sharon Hill, Pennsylvania, while Justice moved to McKean Avenue in Germantown. Their business model was so successful that even the panic of 1873 barely affected them. They kept expanding. They bought two more small stores on 8th Street. This expanded their frontage to nearly 100 feet and gave them more display windows, an additional entrance, and an opportunity to lengthen the aisles. Supplementing the bolts of cloth, women's clothing, and household linens, the stock gradually expanded to include men's and children's clothing, shoes, accessories, furs, upholstery, carpets, books, candy, even bicycles. Justice and Isaac started planning for the upcoming centennial, which they knew would bring thousands of people to Philadelphia. But rather than expand yet again, they opted to do a thorough remodeling job. They had an arched skylight installed, which was supplemented by chandeliers with a ring of gas jets, and new aisles, and new counters, and new materials, and they even opened the basement to customers. By 1874, they were advertising, New Shawl Room, now open for business. This new room is handsomely carpeted and is one of the best lighted, spacious, and most cheerful sales rooms in Philadelphia. 
The basement started to carry sheets, blankets, bedspreads, carpet and stair coverings, tablecloths and napkins, complete line of household staples. Also in the basement was a wrapping desk for tying large packages and a dark room, not for developing photos, but a place where a woman who tried on the latest Parisian silks or plush velvet, which would be worn as an evening gown, could see what the color and fabric looked like by gaslight, far away from the skylight. And of course, at this time, every woman had to own a black dress. At the top landing of the basement stairway, there was a large mirror. One day, a woman coming up laden with purchases thought her passage out was being blocked by another woman, no matter which way she turned. Irritated, she stopped short, and she told her unrelenting reflection, You go that way, I'll go this. A floor man politely explained the flaw in her reasoning. Strawbridge and Clothier took on several cash boys in the 1870s who found a home at the company and who could still be found on the payroll more than a half a century later. The longest employment was of George W. Stevens, who rose from cash boy in 1876 to head of inspection and who did not retire until 1940, when he had completed 64 years with the company. Strawbridge and Clothier also provided honorable work for women. As early as 1876, eight years after its founding, the store employed six saleswomen and one woman buyer. The primary competition came from John Wanamaker, who took the big old freight station near Penn Square. Remember that City Hall did not yet exist. It was still called Penn Square in the center of the city. Wanamaker converted this train station into what he called the Grand Depot for menswear, just in time for the centennial crowds. Wanamaker also kept expanding until he had 16 merchandise departments. The Strawbridge and Clothier staff, by now nearly 280 people, worked from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Saturday, in those pre-union days. They were allowed 45 minutes for lunch. Many of the women ate quickly, and they scurried to 30-minute free classes, which were held on the premises. Christmas and Independence Day were the full days off. Thanksgiving, a half day off. But there were two weeks of vacation in the summer. And speaking of summer, there was no air conditioning. Men who served at the counters were required to wear their vests all year. Women's skirts were black, their blouses only black or white were allowed, and they had wrist-length sleeves. However, from May through September, the women were allowed to wear light-colored dresses. Cash boys sat on benches in groups of about 10 in different parts of the store. Every boy wore a numbered metal badge, round if he worked on the first floor, square if on the second. When a salesperson needed a boy... They pushed a button under the counter, tinkling a bell at the connected station, and the monitor sent a boy scurrying over. The sales check came in three parts, a stub, which remained in the book, a voucher, and an itemization of the sale. The cash boy picked up the check with the money and the goods and took them to a wrapping desk, where a cashier tore off the voucher and put it in a die stamp to be marked paid. At 6 p.m., no gong sounded for closing time. Instead, Justice Strawbridge's older brother, Benjamin, who was in charge of the basement, stood at the head of the basement stairs, and in a voice heard throughout the store, he called out, Cover up! The partnership between the two Quakers was a huge success. They were friends, uppercase F, who were also friends, lowercase F, and they could often be heard giving the other encouragement. I value thy friendship as thee knows. Expansion continued. In June 1878, the buildings at 805, 807, and 809 Market Street were demolished, and less than four months later, there was a five-story extension which had taken their place. 
The store was now roughly 90 by 96 feet. That's about a two-acre footprint with an impressive main entrance at 805. A passenger elevator, probably the first in the city, was installed at the west end of the Market Street front. Eventually, there were 10 elevators. Both Justice and Isaac considered Strawbridge and Clothier a family business, and more relatives came on board, not only to work, but to learn the ropes running the store. First came the brothers, then the sons, and eventually daughters. Their reputation for honesty and integrity among national dealers and distributors was impeccable. Strawbridge and Clothier expected a fair deal and always responded with fairness. The technical advantages of the 1880s were astonishing. Strawbridge and Clothier tried to keep up with these changes. Incandescent lights, the trolley car, the automobile with the pneumatic tire, the cash register, the telephone, the dynamo, the first electricity generator capable of delivering power for industry. All of these improved their ways of doing business. By now, the city counted 800,000 occupants with an equal number in the surrounding communities. Philadelphia was the second largest city in the country. Justice and Isaac were generous with their newfound wealth. They lived comfortably, and they contributed to their own pet projects. One of Isaac's closest interests was Swarthmore College, a co-educational Hickside institution on the old pike to Chester. One of Justice's was Haverford College, founded for men long before on the Lancaster Pike by the Orthodox branch of Friends. When a decision was made to establish a women's counterpart to Haverford in nearby Bryn Mawr, Justice was one of the original contributors. Railroad lines reached out to these western suburbs. For more on building the railroad that became known as the main line, please see Biographical Bites from Bala number 21, Blood on the Tracks at mile 59, Duffy's Cut. The Winwood train station had been built in 1870. Isaac purchased a nearby 60-acre plot, and he built a castellated stone house across Lancaster Avenue. He called it Bally Tor. It later served as the home for Agnes Irwin's school from 1933 to 1960. In 1963, 60 years ago, Bally Tor became the home of the St. Sahag and St. Mesrab Armenian Apostolic Church of Wynwood. You can easily see it as you drive south on Lancaster Avenue. You can also read more about the Clothier Homestead and All Bones Considered, number 34, Tennis Any One. Strawbridge and Clothier even published its own magazine. It was simply called The Quarterly. It was a combination literary and fashion magazine that borrowed elements from Godey's Ladies Book, the eight-page monthly paper edited by Cyrus Curtis's wife, Louisa Knapp Curtis, called The Ladies' Home Journal, and the purely literary Lippincott's magazine. Louis Antoine Godey, Joshua Ballinger Lippincott, and Louisa Knapp Curtis are all interred at Laurel Hill East, while Cyrus Curtis is at Laurel Hill West. I've done podcasts about all of them, except Lippincott, and that will happen eventually. The Strawbridge and Clothier Quarterly consisted of 120 pages or more in each issue, with an annual subscription for 50 cents for four issues. In 1888, the big Hood Bonbright building at 811 815 Market, stretching to Filbert, became available. Its square footage equaled what they already had. They snapped it up and they expanded once again, and now the Market Street front of the store was 155 feet. Strawbridge and Clothier had grown practically beyond imagination. Nearly 2,000 employees, including 40 people involved just in fulfilling mail orders, 35 travelers who covered the states to supply the wholesale departments, 20 people in the auditing department, and now as many as 40 delivery wagon drivers making the rounds of homes and railroad depots. The employees took being part of the family seriously. 
Isaac Clothier said he never made any rules for the employees. They made their own rules. For instance, it would be many years before health insurance would become an automatic employee benefit. But with the encouragement of Justice Strawbridge, employees organized their own relief organization to help each other with unexpected medical expenses. The employees started their own store chorus, and it was so popular they had to rent the Academy of Music to accommodate the crowds who wanted to hear them. They started classes. They taught each other. For the cash boys and eventually the cash girls, many of whom were school dropouts, there were classes in penmanship, spelling, store deportment, and gymnastics. One of the second generation, Frederick Strawbridge, arrived in the fall of 1887 after he distinguished himself at Haverford in varsity cricket and tennis. The pink-cheeked, sandy-haired college graduate's first step up the ladder was to take a course in wrapping packages. Frederick later said, It was hard work for the fellow showing me how. A piece of silk or dress goods, three kinds of lining, and the notions to match without damage to the material, wrapped neatly, quickly, and tied so that the string did not come off just as the driver started on his trip, or worse still, just as the customer was boarding a trolley for home. My father used to say that no boy could be counted an expert unless he could make a neat and handy bundle out of a scythe and a coffee mill. It took Frederick 13 years before he was made a partner. After new construction at 8th Street and the addition of a fifth floor at the Filbert Street corner, an entire floor for the exclusive use of female employees was provided. There was a lunchroom, a sitting and retiring rooms, and even a library. And speaking of women, Strawbridge and Clothier provided a safe place in the city for women to stop, rest, and and socialize. It had not been so long since it was thought improper for a woman to venture out in the street unaccompanied by a man. Now she could go shopping, she could rest in a woman-only parlor with attached toilet rooms, write letters on stationery that was provided by the store, and even read from a selection of newspapers and magazines. By 1888, the partners felt good about how far they had come. Each was quite wealthy. More importantly, they were respected businessmen, both locally and nationally. Isaac wrote to his partner, Today the house stands as no other house in Philadelphia stands, at the very top, commercially and financially speaking, of the dry goods houses of America. No one is rated higher in character and solidity but one or two as high in all the nation. Thy taste in general matters and details is excellent, and thy counsel good on broad matters of policy. I value thy judgment always, and as thee knows, I gladly defer to it on points where thee is stronger than I. In 1895, they decided to admit three partners, Benjamin Strawbridge and Clarkson Clothier each received 3.5% of the profits, while Edward Strawbridge became a partner receiving 3%. Strawbridge and Clothier was now as Philadelphian as William Penn or Benjamin Franklin, and the store started to see second-generation shoppers. The quarterly was converted into a monthly in 1889, 40 pages, 5 cents a copy but it became financially untenable. It shut down after 1890. But by now, the store was blanketing the city's 11 newspapers, two of them in German, with pages of advertising. Competition put on the pressure. N. Snellenberg and Company, manufacturers of men's clothing, sat at the end of the 900 block on market until it moved opposite the new Reading Terminal and opened a general store. Lit Brothers, Samuel and David took over the northeast corner of Market and 8th. Adam Gimble and Sons, which had been in dry goods on 3rd Street, became another neighbor as Gimble Brothers. And there was always Wanamakers looming down the street. 
and not a cash boy was stirring. Their jobs had been superseded by the ultra-modern whooshing pneumatic tube system for whisking payments to the cashiers. On the last day of October in 1894, a startling announcement appeared in local newspapers. Dissolution of partnership and great sale of dry goods. After unsuccessfully battling various health problems, Isaac Clothier retired on 1 January 1895 with a cash settlement of $1,466,000. That is roughly $44 million today. He was 57 years old. The next year, a young man named Isaac Clothier Jr. started as a stock boy and worked his way up. He was made partner in 1903. Justice continued building the firm with the help of his and Isaac's family. In 1897, Strawbridge and Clothier introduced its familiar seal of confidence, although William Penn is far too thin and Tamanund is wearing the headdress of the Dakotas rather than the wispy feathers of the Lene Lenape. This seal was eventually corrected. Justice stepped away from much of the business as other capable hands took over, and he gave up his partnership in 1900. He stayed active in company functions, but was also beset with health problems. He broke an annual tradition when he did not attend the Quarter Century Club banquet in the spring of 1910. Instead, he sent a note. For part of the winter, I have not been very well and am still not quite strong enough for evening entertainments. On the morning of 27 March 1911, shortly after rising at his home, Justice Clayton Strawbridge suffered a paralytic stroke and he died without regaining consciousness. He was 73 years old. He was interred in the family plot with a simple stone in the shadow of the massive Betts Mausoleum in the summit section of Laurel Hill West. Isaac Clothier outlived his longtime partner by several years. He died of pneumonia at Ballytor on 15 January 1921, when he was 84 years old. One of his bequeathals was a towered Gothic hall at Swarthmore Campus, which was built for a million dollars. Isaac and most of his family are interred just a hundred yards or so from the Strawbridge family plot, also in the summit section of Laurel Hill West. And by the way, the Strawbridge family plot and the Clothier family plot were both purchased at Laurel Hill West on the same day, Tuesday, 15 July, 1890. If you're listening to this podcast on the day it's released, that would be 133 years ago today. And initially, the plots were next to each other. But one of the families had a change of heart about their proximity. I have heard people describe the property between Strawbridge and Clothier as ampersand. This podcast is just about the two founding partners and their closeness. What set Strawbridge and Clothier apart from the competition within its lifetime was its commitment to its founding Quaker principles and its belief in family, both the founding family members and the employees who immediately became part of the family when they were hired. I am going to stop here. This is long before the massive building which stands at 8th and Market was erected in the 1930s, before the inevitable expansion to the surrounding communities, starting with Suburban Square and Ardmore, before the offshoot Clover stores, before other advancements which led to a business which during its peak in the 1980s was doing more than a billion dollars yearly in business. But as we all know, Strawbridge and Clothier sadly went under in 2006. I do want to add one personal touch. About 20 years ago, my wife Andrea and I visited one of my old army buddies. We'd both been Vietnam combat medics in 1968 and 69 with 1st Battalion Mechanized 5th Infantry, that's the Bobcats, 25th Infantry Division, that's the Tropic Lightning Division. Blinky had done okay for himself. He was a property manager in Newport, Rhode Island. 
He asked Andrea and me if we'd like to stay in the Strawbridge summer home on Narragansett Bay, and we leapt at the opportunity. Much of this massive three-story beach home had already been subdivided into apartments and condominiums, but the ground floor was pretty much as the Strawbridges had left it. Their Philadelphia home had been on Highland Avenue in Lower Marion. That's about a mile from where we live in Bala Kinwood. We passed it by frequently. Now, much to our delight, there was a shelf full of scrapbooks which contained newspaper clippings of young Strawbridges, probably the third generation, maybe the fourth generation by this time. And their time in the 1930s and 40s, as they made their way through proper Philadelphia society, especially Peggy Strawbridge, we gently looked through these family treasures for a few hours before we retired with the bedroom windows open to allow sea breezes to waft over us. If you want more information about Strawbridge and Clothier in the 20th and 21st century, I strongly recommend the book Family Business, A Century in the Life and Times of Strawbridge and Clothier by Alfred Leaf. It's published by McGraw-Hill in 1968. For the peak times, I suggest Family Business, Volume 3, Strawbridge and Clothier, The Triumphant 80s. That's by Frank R. Veal. It's published by the Board of Directors of Strawbridge and Clothier in 1991. And if you want a more lighthearted and personal look at the business, try a brand new book. I actually delayed the podcast until I had a copy of the new book. It's called Philadelphia Strawbridge and Clothier, From Our Family to Yours. It is by Margaret Strawbridge Butterworth, and it's published the History Press 2023. For more on the history of dry goods stores, I recommend the department store, its past and its future, a review article by Peter Sampson. It's from the Business History Review, Spring 1981, Volume 55, Number 1, pages 26 to 34. Transformations in a Culture of Consumption, Women and Department Stores, 1890 to 1925, by William R. Leach. That is from the Journal of American History, September 1984, Volume 71, Number 2, pages 319 to 342. And finally, Markets in the Meadows, Department Stores and Shopping Centers in the Decentralization of Philadelphia, 1920 to 1980, by Stephanie Dyer. That is from Enterprise and Society, December 2002, Volume 3, Number 4, pages 606 to 612. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you around the cemetery. The August edition of All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories number 53, is called A Good Walk Spoiled. It's about golfers and golf club designers buried at Laurel Hill, including Hugh Wilson, the man responsible for the red baskets instead of flags at Marion Country Club, and Ida Dixon, the first woman golf course architect in the country. In Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories episode number 23 in mid-August, 
I will tell you of the art collector extraordinaire Hugh McElhenney, who Andy Warhol once called the only person in Philadelphia with class. I remind you that there are self-guided tours available for both cemeteries. For Laurel Hill East, download the app. For Laurel Hill West, well, you can find it with your podcasts. There's a walkthrough from the Kidwood Trail entrance to the Pencoid exit and another in the opposite direction. If you do the round trip, it's almost two hours of stopping at Stones, peeping in mausoleums, and hearing about nearly 100 people who helped make Philadelphia what it is today. All Bones Consider and Biographical Bites from Bala are mostly researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine from Temple University, volunteer tour guide, and podcaster for both cemeteries. You can reach me through my email, joe at joelex.net. The theme song, Names at Peace, is by local artist James Harrow. Maybe I'll see you on a tour. Stay safe. Stay well.